just first off, a very warm welcome on behalf of the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice. My name is Mark Cathaway. I'm the Executive Director. And uh, tonight, uh, along with myself, we're very, very pleased to have uh, Rosella Kenoshime, who I'll be introducing in more detail in a few minutes as uh, as the, our elder and resource person, and as well as Trevor Scott, who is a Jesuit who works with the forum, uh, who together will be doing most of the presentation tonight. So I get the kind of hosting role and I get the fun job of putting everyone into small groups for later on. Uh, but to, to begin, as I say, welcome. Uh, it's always wonderful to see the faces pop in from across the country. And maybe when we do the land acknowledgement, uh, We'll have a chance in comments for people just to kind of put in uh, briefly which territory you're coming from, and that will give us a sense of where different people are coming from today. Uh, but I know there's around, we never know how many actually will come, there's around 60 signed up, so that's a great turnout. Uh, so far we have 32 people here, so I imagine we'll have a few more coming in as we continue. As we begin, the first thing that we always want to do is to begin with a land acknowledgement. And uh, land acknowledgements are always both important and difficult in the sense that um, to make a land acknowledgement to where it isn't just something that we do, right? <laughs> make it really meaningful. Uh, and to me, whenever I do a land acknowledgement, the first thing that I like to do is acknowledge the land itself, uh, the land as a living community. I think often when we hear land, for those of us certainly who are settlers or even newcomers perhaps, uh, we think of land as real estate or as like a piece of property. But really here, we're talking about land as a community of life that sustains us, a community that we're part of. Um, the air, the water, all the living creatures, the food, <laughs> give us our, our food, our sustenance, but also our spiritual sustenance in so many ways. It feeds our, our minds, our hearts, our emotions, our bodies. So just to wherever we are to acknowledge the land itself with a sense of gratefulness. And I speak to you tonight uh, from that place most of us know as Toronto or Takaronto, which uh, is in the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and Batoon First Nations, known on the Waga, also known as the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Uh, this territory is subject to, in particular, to a very old treaty, the, the Dish of One Spoon Wampum, which to me is just a, a lovely understanding of sustainability and justice. Uh, the dish with one spoon, the dish being the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes Basin, all the land around that Great Lake Basin, which the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people has agreed to share and care for in a way that there's one spoon, that we don't take more than we need, that we respect the limits of the land, that we make sure that everyone has enough, that we don't take more than we need from that bowl, that we uh, ensure there's enough for future generations, not only of people, but other creatures. Uh, and at the same time, this is this territory is subject to the Williams Treaties from uh, 1923. And so those are the later treaties. But whichever treaty, and tonight we're going to be talking about treaties and ties of kinship, whatever treaties, to understand these treaties as ties of kinship of more than just something written on a piece of paper or kind of a formal kind of agreement, it's really about relationship and living in our responsibilities as treaty peoples. So I invite you wherever you are to write uh, in the chat what territory, what treaties there are, 
and just to take a moment to be mindful of our responsibilities to live as treaty peoples. Uh, responsibilities, but also a celebration of what treaties are. I mean, ties of kinship, kinship is a good thing. <laughs> you know, it's something that feeds us. So certainly there are obligations with the treaty, but there's also uh, a meaning to it. There's a, there's a life to it. So just tonight as we, as we talk about ties of kinship to be mindful of that. Uh, at this at this moment, I'd really like to uh, first off, uh, before I go any further talking about tonight, I'd like to introduce uh, Rosella Kenoshemek. Uh, a lot of things that we could say about Rosella. She's Anishinaabe Gui from uh, Gwimekong and Sita Territory, Manitoulin Island. Uh, She's a retired registered nurse, member of the Sault Ste. Marie Diocesan Order of Service. And uh, also she serves as a member at large of Our Lady of Guadalupe Circle and as director of the, the Catholic uh, uh, Indigenous Reconciliation Fund. I think uh, Rosella just has a wealth of experience as an elder, a lot of wisdom to share with us. And it's always a delight to have Rosella. So I'd like to just and first off, Rosella, to uh, I can only do this virtually, but to to offer uh, this tobacco to you in as a, in gratitude for your presence with us tonight and appreciation. So welcome, Rosella. Uh, if you can share some words with us. I'll speak in my language first because that's one of our protocols that we speak in our language first. Bojo, bojo, Kenabuya, Ani, Rosella, Nishnikas, Nandwekwe, Nishnikango, Beneshindo, Dem, Mokwa, Yanadamawit, Dogading, Wikwemkong, Nadomne Sing, Donjaba. So that I have greeted you when I said bojo, ani, hello. And I give you my, uh, the name that was given to me, Nandwe Kwe. If you want that translation, it means healing woman. Uh, bird is my, my clan and bear is my helper. And I'm from a small place called Doganing, South Bay on the Wequemekong unceded territory that's located on Manitoulin Island, and that's where I'm from. So uh, I say welcome to this uh, virtual meeting that we have, and uh, I'm happy to be here with you and share what I've been asked to share. Thank you so much, Rosella. Uh, we really appreciate your presence with us. And uh, Rosella has been very generous with us. She was on the advisory committee that came up with the guide listening to indigenous voices and has has really uh in so many cases been a, a source of wisdom and insight for us so it's great having you with us rosella once again i'll just talk briefly i, I think most of us know about the guide itself listening to indigenous voices uh was published nearly three years ago and that guide was the fruit of a long process. And as I've said, we worked with an advisory committee made up of both indigenous and non-indigenous people uh, to choose readings and to prepare. And, but this guide, as I think all of you know, is not just a book, it's a process, right? And so what we're about tonight really is about entering more deeply into that process. How do, how do we work with the guide? How do we work with the listening circle or dialogue uh, process that's a part of it? Over the last nearly three years, we've done quite a few of these uh, training sessions, most of them online, especially during COVID. We've done some live ones since then. Uh, but certainly, you know, we, we've 
we've introduced a lot of people to the process, but there are new people continually coming in to this as well. Um, so we want to keep on supporting the process, not just, you know, very much. Our hope is that as people get the guide that they draw a group together and that they, they take the guide and go through the, at least some of the sessions, they might not go through all 11 always, but that they engage deeply with those sessions. And uh, so in these, in this series that we're doing now, starting tonight, this and the, the next session, we're going to focus particularly on, um, on the process of facilitation. And the process of facilitation, I won't go into that right now because Rosella and Trevor will be doing that, but in many ways, it's a simple process. Uh, you don't have to be an expert to be a facilitator. Uh, probably more important to be a facilitator is to be a good listener, uh, someone that can be sensitive to other people. Uh, you don't have to be an expert on everything that's written about in the guide. That's not the point. The idea of the facilitator is really to help create a safe space, a space where people can share and hear each other. And so later on tonight, we're going to have a chance in small groups to try practice facilitation. And uh, okay, right now we're 36, we'll probably divide into about nine groups of four. So it'll be very small groups. Uh, so I'd like to invite people in the chat just to write, if you're interested in, in trying to facilitate tonight in a small group, this is a practice session, it's a low stakes activity. You don't have, if you've never facilitated before, but want to give a hand at trying that, uh, just put your name, just put in the chat, uh, uh, interested in facilitating or something like that. And as I'm forming the small group, so I'll put you in a, a small group like that. Uh, because really along with, the ideas that are being shared, part of the idea of these sessions is to give people an opportunity to actually try things out. And uh, since this is a, a nice group to do it, you're probably with a lot of people who have genuine interest. Uh, some of them have facilitated before. So it's a great opportunity if you want to try that out tonight. So at this point, uh, I'll, you know, just in terms of our schedule, we're going to go uh, from now to a little bit after six with Rosella and Trevor will be talking about the foundations of the listening circle. And then uh, around, let's see, 6.05, we're going to break into small groups and we'll have until about 6.40 just to work on questions one and three out of session five. So that's the ties of kinship session. Uh, and then around 6.40 or so, we'll come back into the large group, and there'll just be a process more, more to share, not what you discussed in those small groups, but anything that came up around facilitation or any questions you might have uh, before we conclude. So at this point, I get to uh, fade into the background, and uh, so I'll invite uh, Rosella and Trevor to begin by sharing some reflections on the, the whole process of the sharing circle and the process of facilitation. Thank you, Mark, um, for opening our evening together, our afternoon together for some of us. Um, so before Rosella and I begin, I'm just, I've put in the chat um, our schedule for this evening as the PDF. So hopefully you'll be able to open that. I can put it in again because the rib, rib, ribbon of the chat goes up quite a bit. So with everyone, <laughs> so um, there it is in the chat. This gives you an idea of the kind of uh, topics we'll be covering um, in the next little bit and uh, our, our timeline and then for the rest of the evening. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, what we 
when we had originally, when we were talking about offering this opportunity for facilitator training um, for this online version, we thought it would be good to have two parts. So this is the first part, the first gathering of facilitator training. And then session two, I guess, you could, not session, uh, gathering two. Um, I don't want to call it session because our chapters are sessions in the guide, so I don't want to confuse you. But our second gathering will be in two weeks time. Um, and our focus for this evening will be on the characteristics of group facilitation. Um, what, is, what is the significance of rounds of sharing? And what is the role of a, of a small group facilitator? Kind of the vision of it, the responsibilities of a group facilitator. <clears throat> Our next gathering in two weeks will be focused on issues and any potential problems that could arise for a group facilitator. So we're not, so that's for next week though. Um, this week, this gathering is more for just the characteristics in, of group facilitation and the vision of uh, sharing circles. So I, I just emphasize that because if you have any questions around issues, you know, as a group facilitator, what do I do when da 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 da? Um, save those kinds of questions, note them, and save them for, um, for for two weeks' time at our second gathering. We will certainly spend a lot of time with those kinds of questions. So we thought we we, we would begin first of all by. Reflecting upon the significance and process of rounds of sharing. Why rounds of sharing? Why do we gather in circles, small circles, you know, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight people? You wouldn't want it much more than that, but you don't want it too small either. So minimum of four. Why do we gather in this way? Where, what is the what is the importance of that? What is the value of gathering in circles? Circle sharing has a rich um, tradition. Um, in we've all been part of circles before online as well, uh, as, well as in person, um, but they have a significant resonance uh, in indigenous communities as well. And we thought that would be very important to share in light of when we come together around listening to Indigenous voices, having that background of the rich role and the tradition of sharing circles amongst Indigenous peoples and Indigenous communities, how that plays a significant role in, in coming together um, and, and sharing. And in a sense, we're asked to kind of take part in sharing with each other in that way um, within listening to Indigenous uh, voices. So maybe if Rosella, could you, and the role of a, 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 uh, the eagle feather or a talking stick, what role does that play in, in uh, sharing and listening with one another um, in sharing circles? So maybe Rosella, if you could share with us a little bit of your of the wisdom of sharing circles uh, in indigenous communities. That would be wonderful. Okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, sharing circles uh, from my perspective of what I have learned and what I have used in in doing sharing circles in my community or communities. So the first of all is everyone in the circle is equal. No one is ahead and no one is behind. Everyone is, is on a good inward journey that helps develop the emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual state of well-being. We come together as one to be united for strength and healing. 
So the sharing circle teaches many things. First of all, is the importance and the sacredness of life. That's what we have to be aware of. So the first one is respect. To respect and consider life with reverence. We respect ourself to be in tune as to who we are, where we came from, why we are here, and what we are all about and where we are going. We must respect others. And when we do that, we show respect for the creator. Everyone shows respect for the one that is speaking and what is shared is held as confidential. So we have to remember to be respectful because respect is one of our seven sacred teachings. It teaches about humility. That means knowing ourselves as a sacred part of creation. And to recognize where we are in this larger scheme of life. And we must remember that we are small, one tiny being, minute. It's knowing that we are all equal. Like I said, no one is greater or smarter or has more than someone else. And so we must be humble that no one is more important than another. It teaches about interdependence that we need one another. We must remember that whatever work we may be doing, we cannot do it alone. And that we depend upon a greater power. It teaches about listening skills. We listen with our, our ears, our eyes, and our hearts. We listen quietly with our ears to truly hear what is being said. We listen with our eyes to see the situation clearly. We listen with our hearts to feel the emotions that are there. And so by listening, we show care for one another. It teaches patience. Everyone in the circle is given an opportunity to speak, but you're also, if you want to pass, you can do that. And so while we speak, we hold an object. I have an eagle feather that I was presented with in recognition for the work that I do. And so we have to care for this feather. So I have this feather. I also have this one. So I have two that I carry along, along in a house with a feather. We must look after our feathers. It cannot be in a place where there's alcohol or drugs. 
and I, um, let's see if I had uh, anything else about the feather, but I was going to wait till after to speak a little bit more about the feather, but um, I can do that after. And also when, so the feather has to be given to you before you can use it. It has to be given by the community that recognizes you for the work that you do. But I also have a talking stick. This was made and given to me. And we can use this in the sharing circle. Sometimes if I do um, a healing circle, I have a stone that I use. It has a hole in it. And sometimes what I do is I ask the people to let go of what it is that they're that they're being, or the experience that they're, you know, emotional experience that they're having. Let go and blow it through the hole. Get it out of you. I also have another stone. Doesn't have any holes in it, but it has impressions where you can hold it. Put your fingers on there to hold it. One on the one side for your thumb and indentations here on the side for your fingers. And those stones spoke to me when I found them to be used for that purpose. So only the individual that holds the feather, the talking stick, or the stone can talk. Nobody else. And when we do healing circles, sometimes you have to give them time. And so sometimes these circles will go for hours. And when we finish talking, we say thank you, or we say miigwech in my language, and we take that we can take that talking stick and we pass it to our left. It goes around that way and comes back. For our First Nations people, it starts like we start in the east and then we go south, west, and north in that direction. Now, if you were from the Six Nations community, the Mohawks, they do it the other way. They go counterclockwise. So whichever, wherever you are, then that's, that's the way it's done. If there is only one Mohawk in, the, in your group, then you acknowledge that. And you may start with that individual and then go counterclockwise. So the sharing circle also teaches about sharing. It's a traditional way of sharing our thoughts, our feelings openly. And so by sharing, we belong. We have what we say, we give and we take. When we take, as, you're, as a listener, you're taking. And as you talk, you give. And so when we do that, we are given half of the circle. When we give, and when we listen, we have the other half of the circle. 
And so we also learn as we listen to the people. And we complete that by giving, by the, the sharing that we do. And so we learn from one another. The sharing circle also teaches about support, helping one another. It's a way of using a peer group for offering support. Everyone comes to learn, to share. Now we have guidelines for our circles. We say it enables everyone to walk our journey in life. It provides the opportunity for everyone to speak and to share their experience. It helps to build self-esteem, confidence, and trust. And the most important thing is that whatever we share is held conf as confidential. This is that safe space that was mentioned. They can say, and share whatever it is and know that they are in that safe space and it will not get out into the public. There is no blame, no judgment. And that we are attentive. We have that deep listening by being present to the other, to the other people that are there. Now, this is not the time to prepare our answer. And but you listen by how are you being affected by what is being shared? And so as you're listening, you do not interrupt. You do not ask questions because you're not holding that talking stick or the feather. And there's no cross talking. So when it is your turn, then you get to hold a feather or the talking stick or the stone. And you're given some time, depending on how many people are there or in the circle. And if you only have 10 minutes, well, you're going to divide that 10 minutes into the number of people you have. And be respectful that you do not, the only person to take the whole time, that everybody is given that time to speak. And if a person does not want to share, they can say pass. But then you come back after and ask them if they would like to share at that time. If there is silence, we tolerate that silence. We accept it. We welcome that silence. And no one speaks twice until all have spoken. And then we go into the second circle. And this is not the time to be teaching or to make a point. The facilitator listens. So usually in the first round, we do our introductions. You say your name, where you are from. If you know the um, treaty area that you're in, um, maybe the work that you that you do or you're involved in. And then we go into the question, answering the questions or question, one question at a time. And when all that, when that question is answered and then you go into the other round and maybe you have another question that you wanna ask. And the sharing has to stay focused, just answer briefly only the question being asked. There's no need for repetition and be reasonable and be respectful of the time.
No, we do. Um, because I am involved with a what we call our ministries program at the Inishabe Spiritual Center. I um we do um probably along the same lines as everything that I talked about, except that we have a candle. That we light. Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then we have, um, we do have a smudging ceremony that we do. Do a prayer. We cleanse our, our hands, our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our mind, and our whole body our heart, and our spirit so that we can be attentive and listen and hear. And whatever people bring, all the negative energies, we put them on that smoke and the smudge. And we use our eagle feather. Our feather represents the sacred bird. And it's the eagle that we ask to take our prayers up to the creator. And it's the creator who will hear those prayers or petitions to give us new energy and take away all those things that we have that are that we are giving up. So in the um in our guidelines for the circles, we always say, remember the seven sacred teachings about respect, which I covered already, humility, compassion, bravery. Sometimes you need that bravery to be able to share what it what it's what's deep in your heart or what's bothering you. And you come to that trust of the group so that you know that you are in a safe space. Be honest to speak the truth, wisdom, and love. Love that is unconditional. 